Okay, I think we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Yesenia Fuentes. I am the communication specialist for the Laos College of Engineering, and I would like to welcome all of you to our Tech Talks speaker series for the month. Um, we are very happy that you're able to join us today. We have a very special and distinguished guest with us, um, Mr. Richard Parks. Um, Richard graduated from Fresno State with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering in 2013. He started working in the aerospace tooling and automation industry right out of college. While, while there, he was able to work able to work tooling for multiple aircrafts, including Airbus A350 and Boeing 77X. He then took a job at Virgin Hyperloop, now Hyperloop One, for three and a half years, where he started off as a tooling engineer and then became a track engineer, magnetic levitation, and then manager of mechanical systems. Last year, he was given the chance to change companies and roles to start working for Skytran as a director of guideways. They also have a magnetic levitation based track system. He currently lives and works in Huntington Beach, California. Due to the start of nature's Skytram, it affords him the opportunity to stay involved with detailed tasks as well as building and running the department. Richard will go through his presentation and we will save the Q&A session for the end of his presentation. Please submit your questions in the chat. I will now hand it off to Richard. Thank you, Senna. Um, hello, all. Uh, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, just really grateful to consider to, to have me here to, to talk to you. So um, just kind of uh, to start off, I, you know, I can't really say like, hey, I'm, I'm responsible for like my career path or trajectory or whatever you want to call it. Um, so in, in every respect, it, it just Thank God for 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 you know all the opportunities and and and, and everything that's kind of like led up to to where I'm at now, which I'm I'm really enjoying. Um, so yeah, uh, just just jumping in. Um, I I feel like I'm an engineer at heart. Um, always like kind of taking things apart, understanding how they work. Um, and started Fresno State um in the in the engineering department and and just that afforded me the opportunity to obviously learn uh, a, a lot about engineering um and then uh, uh after graduating um was able to get a, a job at a company called electro impact um and i'll go over more of what they do and and kind of how i started there um but just kind of as a quick like preview or overview um, uh, I'll go through kind of, you know, what, what led to, what led to my current role. Um, so I started off at, at Electro Impact. Uh, they, they offered me a job right out of, right out of school. Um, it's kind of a, uh, an unknown company, um, but they do a lot of, a lot of work, uh, in aerospace tooling. Uh, aerospace tooling is, is effectively everything that allows a, a, a commercial aerospace company to build their aircraft. They have their design, um, but then in order to actually piece that design together, you have a lot of heavy and bulky and, 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 and awkward components that all have to be uh, in, in certain uh, 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 relative positions to each other in order to, to get everything accurate enough and, and strong enough. Uh, and the tooling is the thing that that puts all those things uh, and and secures all those things where where they need to be, um, where they want to be, so that they can they can be uh, uh, all joined together. Um, there's a lot of automation that goes into that as well. Uh, it's a it's a highly integrated system most of the time, um, and so it's it's it was a really great opportunity. Um, and then actually between that, I I worked at Serpa for a little bit. We we decided to come back. Uh, electro impacts in, in Seattle. Um, so it's kind of, a, it was, a, it was a bit of a change going from Fresno to, to Seattle. Uh, the, the weather is a lot different. Um, so we, we came back, uh, uh, my wife and I did, and then, uh, um, ended up deciding like, Hey, like we missed it. We missed our friends up there, missed the work, um, and decided to move back and, and was fortunate enough that, that, uh, electro impact, uh, uh, allowed me to come back on. Uh, and then from there, ended up working on uh, the new 777X uh, and some other projects. Uh, ended up at another company in um, 2018. Um, actually, there's a huge slowdown in the aerospace tooling industry. Um, ended up getting laid off from Electro Impact. 
Um, and it ended up being a good thing because I got, I got brought on at M Torres with a, a basic promotion and, 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 and a pay raise, which was, which was amazing considering the circumstances. Um, and then, um, I was only there for about six months, did some, did some stuff there. That was, that was great. But again, the, the aerospace tooling industry was really slowing down. Um, and, um, even there, like a couple months or a couple weeks after I started there, they were already talking about if we don't get more work, um, then we're going to have to start going through additional layoffs, which is, you know, kind of scary, especially since I had just gotten into this company, got a call from Virgin Hyperloop for a, a position that I'd forgotten I even applied for uh, almost a, a year prior. And they offered me a, an opportunity to, to start as a, an automated tooling engineer, um, which was exactly what I was doing. Um, it was a bit of a demotion in, in role, um, but it at least afforded me the opportunity to kind of switch industries um, in a lot of respects and, and kind of like see what, what a startup is all about. Um, ended up getting my PE, um, in machine design, which at school, I didn't really even know was an option. I just knew like the, you know, you take the FE exam and then you can get your PE. And, and I thought that that seemed like a, a great idea. So I, I, I tried for that. I, I got my EIT. I passed the, the fundamentals of engineering and, and then, uh, funnily enough, it, in aerospace tooling, it's, it's actually quite typical to have a professional engineer. Uh, who stamps designs, especially for Boeing, um, uh, as a machine design, uh, a professional license engineer for, for machine design. So I ended up, had enough experience for that, had enough sponsors for that. So um, decided to sit that exam and, and pass um, and just been maintaining that ever since. Um, and then went through Virgin Hyperloop for a couple of years and learned what electromagnetic levitation systems are all about and, and, and how to deal with, with uh, uh, maintaining, maintaining uh, uh, all the requirements there, all the precision there, all the electromagnetic requirements, et cetera. Um, thinking that, you know, this is, this is interesting, right? Um, but, you know, there's not really that many maglev systems in the world. There's, there's one in Shanghai um, and there's a really advanced one in Japan but not everybody's, you know, lining up to, to, to put a maglev system in their country or their city. Um, so, you know, in a lot of respects, I thought, oh, this is, this is nice, but, you know, I don't, I don't really know, you know, where, where this is going to take me because, you know, the maglev is, is really interesting and all, but there's really not many people doing it. Um, and funnily enough, I got a call uh, from Skytran saying, hey, there's, there's this, there's this position opening up. They also have maglev, and and these are all the the different parameters of this this uh, this role. And it, it just happened to pretty much every experience that I've had, even through school, uh, basically uh, all work together to to kind of give me the the skills and experiences that I needed to to step into that role. So, um, been you know from my perspective, amazing uh, to kind of go through this and 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 um, be able to uh, be afforded this opportunity to. To actually start a department and 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 hire up a brand new team and and literally direct you know how how this problem is going to be solved from from um, from you know in a lot of respects in, uh, the initiation uh, not not the overall architecture but the, you know a, a large portion of of uh, of the problem set. Um, so I'm going to go through kind of you know my. Uh, uh, projects i think in a lot of respects that that i've done and, and go through each company and and we'll kind of see see where that where that gets us um so electro impact as i mentioned is a is an aerospace is an automated tooling and machine design company um they're they're usually referred to as like a an integrator um meaning that that they are the final vendor that it puts all the pieces together before handoff to a, a commercial uh, aerospace company, whether it's Airbus or Boeing or Bombardier or, or Embraer or SpaceX or Blue Origin or, or you know, there's a lot of uh, space uh, space companies now that that they that they do work for. Um, but you can kind of see here a lot of a lot of what comes up initially, like when you when you search for them, is is a lot of robotics. They do a lot more than that. Um, and, uh, one of the things that, that I started on when, when I was hired there 
was uh, the A350 wing cell. Um, so the, the interesting thing about this company is that you're given a, a really far reaching set of responsibilities. Um, it is not a typical company. Um, I have never really seen a company like it since, especially a company that, that was as big as Electron Impact is or was. And um, when I say uh, a large portion of responsibility, I, I literally mean all responsibility. Um, it's a it's 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 organizational structure is extremely flat, meaning that there's there's no handoff for for design responsibilities. There's no like sales engineer and then a program manager and then a lead engineer who then kind of like divvies up uh, all these jobs and then to a designer who then passes it off to an analyst who then passes it off to a manufacturing engineer who then passes it off to you know a, a, a procurement person and logistics and et cetera et cetera et cetera. Um, the company is is of the mindset that the person who's designing the tool who's designing the machine is the point is the one that that procures it and builds it. So it it was as as a new graduate, I didn't know any different. I didn't know that that you're supposed to have a procurement department. I didn't know that you're supposed to have like like a, a project manager that looks at every piece of of the project and said, all right, this is when this is going to be done, and this is when this is going to be done. Um, and then it's supposed to be handed off to like a, a tech that literally like, you know, cranes it into place and torques all the fasteners and, and then, uh, you know, have the, have the customer into the factory and, and, and to get it signed off, um, at Electron Impact, there's really nobody to hand it off to. There's, you're given a part of, uh, the specification from the customer and you literally have to find concepts that that allow us to, to put all this together, um, whether it's designing steel structures or designing machine elements or incorporating pneumatics or, or, or servos or, 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 or any number of things. Um, so it's, it's, it showed me that what it takes to get something done. It showed me, you know, you, you have this very broad problem set to begin with and you have to ask questions. You have to ask questions, whether it's the, the customer to figure out what, what it is they actually want. Because when all you're given is a piece of, you know, like, you know, 50 pages of, of in a Word document that's just a spec that has all these line items in it saying, we want this, we want that, we want this. Uh, you have to really read through it and understand like, well, you know, are, are these two things at odds with one another? Like if, if they want, uh, you know, if they want it to be a, a, as, 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 uh, as, as cheap as possible, but they also want it to be as precise as possible and they want it to be done as fast as possible. You know, that's, it's, that's not, it's, those things are in some respects mutually exclusive. Um, so you really have to, to look through and understand what it is you're signing up for. And then you have to understand like whether or not you're actually meeting that requirement. Um, so a lot of it has to, to it boils down to, to, you know, just communication and and just understanding what the problem is, and then understanding uh, the, the kind of the first principles that goes into uh, uh, making that a reality. Um, so, uh, jumping into my first kind of assignment, I was basically told like you're on the A350 wing cell project, um, and um, in, in a lot of respects, the company doesn't really have a lot of set processes for like, here's, here's a new engineer. Here's, here's what you're, you're learning. Here's, here's what you're going to do. Um, it really requires everybody to just ask questions. Um, and I'm not saying that the way the company is structured is, is ideal. Um, but, but that's the way it was. Um, so it really required me to, to find someone who knew the information and, and just keep asking questions until I knew enough about the problem that I could then design a solution for the problem and then to, to keep asking questions and, and to keep trying to think of like, what's the next step after this? All right, well, I've got this option. So now what do I do? And, and it's like, oh, well, you know, you, you ask the customer if, if, you know, if that's what they want. And then, and then the next step is, is they, they approve that and, and you say, all right, well, we're going to design a prototype of it and we're going to cycle test it and we're going to stress test it. 
Um, and again, at, at this company, there's nobody to hand that off to. So it's literally, you become the test engineer, um, the stress analyst, um, and, and everything is, is obviously has to, has to go through, well, for Airbus, it has to go through, um, uh, CE stamp process. Um, so it actually has to go through, uh, like a governmental organization to sign off on this entire structure to make sure it's structurally sound, make sure it's ergonomic to make sure, uh, you know, it's not going to hurt anybody. Um, and, and, you know, they, they care less about whether it's doing what it's supposed to do and more about, you know, is it following like all the standards and stuff that, that, that it's supposed to, to follow. So, um, I'm going to kind of jump into just the, the problem set now and stop babbling about, uh, about, uh, uh, all the, all the, all the other stuff around it. Um, so the, the first task was a build, build this kind of like wingtip deck that allows people to access the end of the, 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 the wing, uh, the, the tip of the wing to, to add in a strap that allows them to put the winglet on. Um, and basically just went through the entire design process. And I'm gonna fast forward through these just to kind of get to, uh, uh, what I'm gonna walk you through is, is effectively how the wing is built. So this is the A350. Um, you can kind of see that at the, end, the ends there, it's got kind of this sweep up uh, to the wing. Um, it's, it's a carbon fiber, uh, plane. I think it was designed just after like the 787. Um, so the wings are all carbon fiber. I believe the entire fuselage is, is carbon fiber. Um, and then on, on the top left, you can actually see the, the wings themselves are leaving the Broughton facility, which is in England, getting into the Beluga. And then they're going to fly into, I believe it's Toulouse to be put on the A350. Um, so this is the Airbus plant in Broughton. Which is kind of the middle of nowhere, England. It's it's about thirty minutes from Liverpool and it's about an hour from Manchester. Um, so just a lot of fields and farms and stuff. And then there's just this aircraft or this Airbus facility, which was kind of cool. Um, and then you can kind of see on the left there, that's the hangar that they that they gave us to kind of be our temporary offices while we're while we're we're, we're building this thing. Um, so it it kind of starts off with uh, uh, the the wing factory. Um, and you can kind of see one cell I've highlighted there. Um, they're all kind of packed in there together. Everything's kind of doing a lot of stuff. A lot of the yellow stuff is all like the tooling. A lot of the white stuff is, is like integrated tooling where it's, it's the tooling itself for the, the aircraft parts. And then you can't really see them, but in, in that cell that I've highlighted, there's, there's some, uh, some gantries with uh, some large uh, uh, end, end effectors on them to actually uh, drill and fill uh, um, uh, temporary fasteners in, in the wing, between the wing and the, and the, the ribs. So this is, this is one of the cells. You can kind of see where these, these uh, uh, people are standing. There's this end effector here for the machine that's designed and, and built by Electro Impact. The you can kind of see the feet of the gantry. You can't really see the gantry. It's up above the, where the picture's cropped. Um, that's also you know electro impact. Pretty much, well, actually everything that you see here except the concrete and the office space behind was designed and and, and built by uh, electro impact. Um, in construction terms, they're, they're effectively EPC, except they have pretty much all the designers in house as well as the uh, the, the the builders and, and installers in house. Um, so these, the kind of the decks that are flipped up, these are, are the, the effectively like the, the wing access decks. So they actually match up to the contour of the A350 wing. Uh, these lower kind of robot looking things are uh, machines uh, that machine the underside of the wing. And then this, this machine here machines the, the top of the wing. And when I say machine, it's really like they're drilling uh, between the, the skin and the, the aluminum ribs. Uh, and then, uh, then actually a, a mechanic will go in and fill that with a, with a bolt. Um, but the machine itself will put in what are called temporary fasteners um, or single-sided uh, uh, temporary fasteners to allow the wing to actually move from one cell to another. Um, when I was brought on, they had already had this cell built, uh, but they were building a phase one and a phase three cell. So phase one was the initial build, phase two was the machine cell, and then phase three was the final assembly cell. Um, and then in between there's, there's a few operations for the panels. Um, so you can kind of see this cell, the, uh, the, 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 flaps are lifted up and then you've got all this kind of like these orange, 
kind of uh, uh, semicircles here are actually uh, safety locks, but there's all these receivers on there to actually accurately align the the spar, um, and then uh, which allows it to pulse the wing. So the first thing they do is they bring in these these ribs. Um, so the ribs are these kind of this greenish kind of color. I think it's hexavalent chromium, which is actually a pretty bad substance um, if not properly handled. Uh, but it's it's it it provides a lot of corrosion protection. Um, and then on either side here, you can kind of see it in beige. Uh, those are the um, the spars. So it's kind of like the legs of a ladder, and then the ribs are like the rungs of a ladder. And there's these spars. And there's three individual spars that make up this wing. So what they'll do is they'll bring in an entire mobile deck with all of these ribs on them and the spars on them just floating in space. They will align these spars into the tooling receivers uh, on either side, um, which will then claim them and fixture them perfectly. And then there's slide axes on the two outboard sides that will slide them into correct alignment and correct positioning longitudinally. Um, or out uh, outboard of the wing on on both sides then they can they can uh, bolt those together and then there's there's like these float axes and stuff on the deck for each one of these ribs um there's also you can kind of see these like little feet coming through here um those are actually for something called a strong back uh, and that what that strong back does is it keeps that rib uh, uh as flat as can be um, because what happens when you have an entire billet of aluminum, which this rib is cut from, uh, is as you, as you start to remove material, uh, that material has internal stresses. So as you remove material that's actually keeping it in position, it will start to like warp and bend and twist. Um, so what these, what these strong backs do is it actually keeps that rib as straight as possible until the skins are on either side, which then uh, fixture it in place. And then they can go through and, and remove these strong backs. So those strong backs were designed by Electron Pact. The all of this tooling was. Um, so it's it actually a really, really interesting company to work for because uh, pretty much everyone you talk to was was responsible for designing uh, some of this tooling. Um, and it, it was it was a great place to come up because there was always somebody to ask questions of, right? How did you do that? Or like, why, like, why is that design like that? And, and a lot of people, are, they're just, they're just engineers and they just, you know, they they love to talk about the stuff that they do. Um, so I just was always asking questions like, you know, like, you know, obviously being considerate, but obviously just asking as many questions as I could get away with on, on, on how all this stuff was put together, why it was done that way. Like, you know, dealing with like thermal expansion effects, dealing with with alignment issues, and and uh, just just keeping just just keeping those lines of communication open and, and figuring out as much as I could beyond just my own scope of the project, um, which is actually really small in comparison to all the other stuff that's going on here. So here's a top view of the spars, the ribs, and then you've got these D nose ribs on on either side here, the 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 fore and aft part of the the wing. Um, you can kind of see here they're they're all in in uh, uh, locked into these receivers. Now these decks are effectively like the the first thing that that I was given as an example. Hey, we we have these decks. We want to simplify them for for uh, the the next round. They're you know the entire thing flips up and and this is why. But we don't really need that. Um, we need a different version of it. Uh, and then you can't really see the deck here, but it, this, 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 basically this, just this end, that was kind of like my portion of it. And then I did some stuff over here in the shark wing and, and, and a few other things, but, uh, mostly just kind of like this one portion at the end, um, you kind of see all these workers in there in situ. Um, so after they put those ribs and spars into place and after they're all bolted together, um, and it's now, now the, the, the wing is kind of starting to take shape. It has some structure to it. Um, now they bring in the, the wing skin. So they ship these wing skins in, I believe one comes from Georgia and one comes from Spain. Um, they fly them in on that beluga and then they, they, you know, again, this tooling is, is kind of brought around, uh, it's lifted up off, uh, onto this lifter, uh, again, designed and, and built by Lodge Impact. Um, it's brought into the wing cell here. You can kind of see Boris Johnson and some other people kind of taking a tour of this. Um, and uh, it's basically lowered onto the 
um, the, the, the ribs. You can see all these like these ribs. They got like a little flat feature on them. Those are like the rib feet. Uh, and that's actually where the skin is bolted through um, to the, the rib. Um, once that's done, you can kind of see these kind of stub up fasteners here. Those are all temporary fasteners. Um, so what that allows the, for is it allows that wing to hold its shape, um, especially when they move it from one cell to another. Um, and it also allows them to, to put it back into place. So those temporary fasteners can be removed. The entire panel can be removed, taken to a deburization, and then put back accurately in place so that all of those bolt holes still line up. And then they put the temporary fasteners back in there to compulse it to the next cell. And then they can go through all this, this bolting operation. What they're doing here, though, is they're actually going through, and I believe that's a machining fixture. Or is that a drill bar? Um, so they're actually doing uh, all this detailed work on, on the end of the wings. So you can kind of see they've each one of these, these, these flip floors has its own kind of like little mini flip floor that allows them further access to, to the edge of the wing. Um, you can actually see here on the right, these are the, actually the new, the new style decks. So the top of the deck is actually a lot flatter. You can kind of see over here, this deck, it's actually the entire thing is, is sloped. Um, and from an ergonomics perspective, from a, from a, like a, uh, a, like an EN standard perspective, it's not ideal. There's a lot of trip hazards and, and all the rest of that stuff. So a lot of the, the, the scope of all the rest of this decking was, Hey, we need to, we need to make as much of a, of a walkway as we can without, without all these like, you know, odd, you know, angles and curves and stuff. Uh, additionally, we need to make it cheaper because we're we're building, you know, uh, eight more cells of this, and and we don't want to pay the same price that we're paying over here. Over here, uh, you can kind of see this this wing tap deck deck here. Um, what what was happening there is um, uh, effectively this this entire thing. They would flip it up, and they would move it out of place. So it actually it was it was detachable, and um, they they would either lose it or it was, it was just kind of a hazard. Um, so part of my constraints was, hey, uh, we need to, we need, they need to be able to work on this end. There's tooling underneath, so you gotta avoid that. Um, and in and, and a lot of respects, a lot of the constraints that I had, I had to go figure out, hey, who was working on the areas closest to mine? Who was working on the tooling underneath? Who was working on the, the main structure that I'm gonna connect to? How, how is it even gonna connect? Um, so a lot of fun engineering problems to solve that aren't readily apparent in this. Uh, one is that this deck is pneumatically controlled. It's not controlled by, by a CNC, um, which is actually a bit of a throwback um, considering a lot of the stuff that, that we're doing today. So I had to learn pneumatic logic. There's like OR valves and valves uh, all done pneumatically. Uh, which is this is, is is basically unheard of now. And typically now you just have a, a, a valve manifold and a CNC controlling or a PLC controlling it. Um, but one of the things too is like people actually like, you know, are working in this thing. So one of the things I had to do was make sure that the pressure was low enough that it's not going to crush somebody. But at the same time, the pressure has to be high enough so that the, the deck doesn't surge and it can actually uh, uh, get to where it needs to go. Um, once that's all done, the, the, the skins are on. This is actually after bolting. You can kind of see it's nice and smooth. They've got this thing on the end. This thing is actually called a dummy rib. All it's really doing is it's just holding position of these panels on either side while everything else is being fixtured. Then this thing is actually removed. Um, at this point, it's still on, it's still moving. Um, this, they might actually be doing a pulse operation from one, one cell to another here. Um, but then it goes down to this, this lay down uh, for final prep. So they'll put on uh, uh, some of the hinge line stuff, uh, et cetera. And then once that's done, um, you can actually see here it's removed. Uh, and then they, they bring it over to final prep for, for shipping. Uh, and they package it up and then they'll put it in the, they'll put it in the beluga and go. So overall, like it was just, you know, kind of an amazing project to work on. Um, it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really seem as great when, when you kind of see all that other stuff that was going on and just say, all right, well, my, my part, my portion of this was, was this deck over here. Um, but what it afforded me was the opportunity to see all of this other stuff and how all of that other stuff worked together, uh, as well as give me a project 
to, to go through the design of, detail out how all of this stuff is gonna get made, um, how, how we I got a limit switch here for a third position. So it can, once it's backed off and the, the strap is in place, it actually has a third uh, set point halfway through, um, as well as, as building the prototype. So I got through the, the concept and, and then the project manager was like, all right, well, you know, when, when's the prototype gonna be, get, be done? And I was like, what do you mean? Like, well, you gotta build a prototype and cycle test it and stress test it, right? All right, let's go, you know? So um, ended up building this prototype um, with the timeline and all the rest of that stuff. Um, and, and even the budget, it was like, well, you know, uh, uh, can you weld? Oh yeah, I, you know, I learned to weld in Formula SAE. Uh, I, you know, I can, I can probably throw something together. All right. You know, so I, I got all these panels cut from a laser cutter, piece them all together. Uh, there was a welder on site that, that did some preliminary settings for me and then just, just went to town. Um, so this was actually, uh, a, a, this fixture itself with all these I-beams and stuff I designed, put together that we had some, some beams on, on, on site, um, found out nobody was using them, put them all together, fixture the deck uh in in a similar fashion to how it was going to be in situ and then did a cycle test for uh, the full 30 year life um and then actually did a stress test so basically cut a hole into it uh found an anchor in the ground and, and pulled on it with uh, 3,000 pounds it didn't break so i knew it had a factor of safety of three because the the requirement was a thousand pounds and then i knew i knew my design was good did all the final design did all the final drawings sent it off to the vendor Went and visit the vendor and uh, they had a, it was a French vendor. They had a plant in Tunisia. So I got to fly to Tunisia for a couple of days, make sure everything was, everything was going well before, for final deliver, delivery. And then uh, I was craned into place. Um, I was actually in, I was in Broughton for about four months. Uh, my wife was pregnant at the time and we actually had to fly back. So I didn't get to install my own stuff. Um, but uh, I got, I got pictures of, of, uh, of uh, my colleagues uh, installing it for me. So, uh, which actually allowed me to, to write an install plan, which was good. Um, but then at the end of the day, once this was all done, the, the next step was actually uh, getting, getting buy from the customer as well as writing the operations manual, the, uh, the maintenance manual and the, the tool uses instructions. Um, so when I say full scope, it's, it's everything, including the, including the technical writing. And you can kind of see here, over here, I ended up, uh, I had eight millimeters between between this precision tooling uh, and my deck. Uh, so I had to do quite a bit of, of uh, uh, analysis and iteration to get this deck strong enough to, to get the L over 400 deflection requirements as well as all the stress, et cetera. Um, but it, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's kind of humbling because when you look at it, you, any, anybody looking at it can't really tell how much time and effort went into doing this, except maybe other, other engineers. So it's kind of one of the humbling things about, about engineering is that you, you don't really get to show off all that much. Um, here's another thing I did. It was a retrofit for this. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an R and D uh, post mill. So this end effector here ended up uh, redesigning this end effector for a, a different tool set. So this is actually the final project or the final product uh, on its actual final gantry. Uh, but before that gantry was built, they had to test this thing, the feeds and speeds and stuff. So basically just ask questions. Hey, you know, this seems like a really cool, you know, this, this automated fiber stuff seems really cool. Is there any way I can help? And somebody was like, yeah, there's this, there's this retrofit we've got to do. Are you interested? Yeah, sounds good. And again, just asking questions and, and, and figuring stuff out. Um, so it's got, you know, couple servos on either side to, to take care of backlash and precision location. It's got a shield over it to protect the pinion. It's got this ATI, I think it's ATI or API. It's got a, a, a basically a tool changer. Um, and then basically just did the, the fatigue, fatigue check for a lifetime, did a, a lot of the, um, uh, the e-chain stuff. And, and basically it was, it was deflection limited. So it did a lot of the deflection calcs uh, because this, this entire structure uh, 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 can, can slide in the, is what's the Z direction into and out of the page. Uh, and basically I had to make sure it didn't deflect more than five, five thousandths of an inch at full extension with, uh, the, the, the cross loads on it, as well as the, the, uh, I think it was 1500 kilograms was the, the, uh, um, was what this thing weighs. 
Um, so all, all in all, just, you know, and then, and then that brought me to, to some other, some other tooling. Um, yeah. Uh, but I, what I want to get to real quick is, so, so this is the, the, the triple seven wing build. Um, same kind of thing. It's, it's really similar, except this one's actually a lot more complicated. Um, each one of these stanchions moves up and down independently. So each one of these is actually a three axis machine. Um, and then one PLC is tying the entire thing together. Um, and this, this project, I think took us three and a half years all in. I was on this project for about two and a half years. There was between 250 to 300 engineers on this project, super integrated. And then at the end of the day, like I, I really can't even point to what I designed. Um, what I designed was a, a mechanical alignment uh, um, system. You can barely see this kind of like bump out here. You can kind of see it down here. Uh, effectively, I, I did my job so well that I got the robot bed guys to incorporate my design into their structure, which saved us a lot of cost, saved us a lot of alignment issues because they're already aligning this bed. Uh, and, but at the end of the day, I kind of like designed myself out of, out of, uh, the limelight because, you know, all my stuff ended up just being incorporated into this. Um, you can't even really see the, you can kind of see it over here, but you can't even really see the wheel set on this, on this structure. Uh, you can see these orange AGVs. Um, you can kind of see it here in, in the sections that don't have a lower machine. Uh, we've got these like, like yellow kind of uh, angle, angle irons at the very end of it. Uh, it's accurate to 10 thousandths of an inch. Um, but the, the main struggle with this mechanical alignment system is that it, it is using, uh, here's, a, here's kind of another view. You can kind of see it right there. It's a different deck, this lower panel loader. Um, at the end of the day, there's, there's four, four mobile decks that I had to design for. The problem was the AGV, while accurate, can't fit in the wing cell. So at some point, this has to be handed off. And that was, that was pretty much the information I was given to start this with. Uh, oh, and, and we didn't plan for it in the budget, so keep it, keep it affordable. Um, so, and, and normally it's kind of like, well, you know, that's, that's, that's not enough information. And, and, and in a lot of respects, it's not. And in a lot of respects, pretty much every problem set you get is not really going to be enough information. You always have to ask questions. You always have to say like, well, you know, why are we doing this? Like, what's the point in order to understand how your design is, is going to be implemented in order to understand, like if you're actually solving the problem. So um, a lot of this stuff ended up putting me in a position to, to, to be where I'm at right now, uh, which is, is, is designing these guideways. Um, uh, I, I never really expected to, to be in maglev, but maglev is a lot, sim is really similar to aerospace tooling in that there's a lot of deflection criteria that you have to design for. There's a lot of high accuracies that you have to deal with. And it's a very highly integrated system, uh, especially when you consider uh, a maglev is more like flight than it is like a train. Um, especially when people are trying to do things like magnetic damping uh, and magnetic suspension uh, it, it, at the same time as, as they're doing uh, uh, maglev flight. So uh, the other thing too is laser trackers. Um, again, <laughs> learn laser trackers at, uh, well, in aerospace tooling, which allows you to get, you know, uh, about 10 thousandths of an inch at, you know, like 50, 60 feet uh, of positional accuracy which now has become a, a mainstay of, of, of uh, uh, basically how, how a lot of these, these designs are, are going to be realized uh, while at, uh, at Skytran. So yeah, Virgin Hyperloop uh, can't really share a lot. A lot of it's covered under intellectual property and the same with Skytran. Uh, what I can share though, Skytran is considered a personal rapid transport. So the idea is smaller pods instead of, a, instead of a, a, a large train with hundreds of people on it, uh, it's, it brings it down to a smaller pod. So two to four people or one to four people. And the point is, if, if you're only carrying one to four people, those people care about their final, their, their, the, the, the final location. They, they care about that station that they want to get to. They don't want to ride one line and get off and then catch another line and then ride there and wait for the next train. Uh, so the idea is, is to provide a means for the vehicle to switch between lines itself 
uh, and then provide by providing smaller vehicles, we can provide on-demand vehicles for individuals instead of having a, a group of people waiting on a platform for one train to come by. Uh, the other thing too is that now with only one pod, it doesn't have to stop at every station. It only stops at the station that you want to stop at, which need, now means that the, the overall system is more efficient because there's not a start and stop every time. It just keeps going. Um, and that's that's pretty much the, the gist of it. The other thing too is it's all elevated. So by making it all elevated, uh, the, the hope is we get away with uh, a, a lot less uh, right of way issues that we would have to deal with as well as a lot of uh, utility uh, uh, like dealing with a lot of uh, like utilities, which which tend to be a, a cost driver in, in a lot of uh, like rail projects and stuff, because you have to you're constantly moving underground utilities from one location to another, um, which uh, can tend to be a large actual cost of the of the project. Um, I think I think we're almost over time here, so I will uh, hand it back. I think. Thank you. Um, we're going to go into the Q and A session now. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. We do have one right now. Um, Richard, the question is, how much of the knowledge and skills that you learned while going through college did you find applicable, applicable in your job? I would say a lot, um, but not all at the same time. Um, I, and, and, and what I mean that is, is I, I, I kind of, in, in a lot of respects, when I was at school, it was almost like, oh, this is almost like hazing to be an engineer. It's like, you got to go through all of this other stuff, right? And, and it was like, when am I going to use this stuff? And, and I can honestly say I've used probably, I can't say all of it, but I, I've used probably like 80% of it at one time or another. And um, I had a, a, an uncle who's a manufacturing engineer. Um, and I, I, Actually, I think it was it was either him or somebody else um, told me like keep your books, um, and I was like that makes sense. Like if I'm going to use that stuff, I might as well use the book that I'm used to, and I I have I've I've used almost every book that I've kept, whether it's mechanics and materials, especially machine design. Like I even have the book. I don't know if you can see that uh, right here. Like I had to buy another one of these because I use it so much. Um, a lot of what I get into is first principles. So uh, stress, deflection, uh, bolt, uh, bolted joints, whether it's preload, thread tear out, um, uh, tolerance stacks, so statistics, um, welding, lots of welding, um, lots of lots of uh, lots of stuff. Uh, systems engineering. Um, funnily enough, coming through Electron Pact, I didn't even know what systems engineering was. But that's effectively what we were doing. So I can honestly say, like, I've, I've used quite a bit. Um, one class in particular, like, really, I think, drove it home for me the most when I first started. And that was the, uh, it was like design of design of tests. I think it was, I forget what it was, like, ME159 or something like that. Um, basically, it's like the laboratory, like, senior, senior, you know, class. Um, and that really drove home the point for me, like, what it is you're trying to do. With, with testing engineering is, is you're basically proving your design, right? I've designed this thing. I think it's going to work. So how do you know it's going to work, especially when it, when it matters? Uh, and, and you basically just design a test for it. And you say, this is, this is, this is the aspect that it's testing. This is the, this is the, the, the kind of the, the information that I'm gathering at the end to prove that it's done. And, and, and then you just get it done. It's, it's not, um, it's, it's not, uh, uh, I don't want to say it's not difficult because it's 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 it can be tedious, um, but it's it's important. Uh, but it's not. It's just a stepwise progression. It's just understanding that 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 is how that information is going to be used, and, and that it's important. So I, I can honestly say uh, uh, quite a bit, quite a bit. Thank you. Our next question is. How did you feel the environment was as a new engineer at your first job? Oh, that was a uh, tricky. Uh, it, the environment was one. It was I can honestly say it was like sink or swim. Um, lots of well-intentioned people, but there was not a very. It was not a structured environment. Um, the, the company started off very small. 
and they started getting into this idea that like why can't the engineers just do that why can't they they build the stuff that they design uh why can't they uh um why can't they turn wrenches? Why can't they drive forklifts? Why can't they they operate cranes? Um, and it kind of turned into this thing like, you know, like, why can't they be project managers? Why can't they, you know, and they didn't change job titles. They didn't say like, all right, well, that's somebody's role now. It's just, you're given your design and you're given the freedom to get it done the way you think it should be done. Uh, obviously there is, there is somebody, there's a project manager who's actually just more like a mechanical engineer, controls engineer, electrical engineer at the top of the project, but they're not your, your manager. Um, they only manage the, the project. Um, and, and so it was kind of interesting. It, it was kind of very freeing, but at the same time, it was, it, it could be stressful because there's really nobody there to catch you. There's really nobody there to say, Hey, like, have you thought about this? Hey, have you thought about that? There, there are a few people there that, that would speak up if you're willing to listen, but it really required me and, and anybody else there to, to try and go find an answer and, and, and try and see the entire like scope of the problem from, from start to finish and then find people who could either give us the answers or find ways to, to find the answers. So for, for me, I think coming up, because I, I went back to school um, I, was, I, I didn't go to, to, to college right out of, out of high school. I, I had a construction job and I understood like, you know, here's, here's a, there's a start and there's a finish. So I think that helped a little bit. Uh, but going into it, it was, it was, it was, it was not, I don't want to say a blessing and a curse, but it was kind of along those lines. Uh, it was, there wasn't really much structure to say, Hey, do this this way. Uh, but at the same time, there wasn't any structure saying, Hey, you have to do this this way. So it gave it gave me the freedom to 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 get things done, but at the same time, it could be stressful because if I'd never done it before, how do I know how it's supposed to be done? So I I think I dealt with some of that a little bit uh, going through that, and and I would ask a lot of questions and and would not really want to pull the trigger on something unless I exactly knew it was gonna to work. Um, but I had to like learn to overcome that in a lot of respects and and, and figure out how to get something done in, in the time frame that it needed to get done in. So yeah. Thank you. Our next question is, how was the difficulty of moving from projects at Hyperloop compared to Skytram? Um, can, you say, can you state the question again? Sure. How was the difficulty of moving from projects at Hyperloop compared to Skytram? Okay. So I think I, I think the, the question is asking like like basically like kind of how, how, what, 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 what was the difficulty, I think, moving from like Hyperloop to, to Skytran um, project rise. And, and I think um, in some respects, it was, it was freeing um, uh, because it, 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 at Hyperloop, we, we started to get a lot of process control in place. And so it's kind of this double-edged sword when, when you have process control, especially when you're trying to go for like an ISO 9000 certification uh, ISO 9000 basically will audit you and make sure that you're following the processes that you say you're going to follow. Um, and it can be difficult, especially if you think about like somebody's got to think up this process that everybody's supposed to follow. It's prescriptive, especially for, for ISO. And if you make it so prescriptive that there's no other way of getting it done, you have to think of every possible edge case five years from now, four years from now, or, or even three months from now to make sure that somebody's going to know what they're supposed to do if they're following this process. The other way is make the process less prescriptive, um, but it's, 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 it's difficult to, to, to kind of know that at the time. So we ended up trying to, to create all these processes, which ended up slowing a lot of things down. Um, and unfortunately, like my group was still kind of like, when when we built a lot of the stuff I can't talk about, we basically built a, a version two uh, a test uh, um, a fixture in 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 their 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 desert facility, uh, and and we got a lot of stuff done. But again, like I think Hyperloop was a, a bigger company, so in some respects there was a lot more momentum at Hyperloop than there was at Skytran. But at Skytran, it 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 afforded me uh, a lot more oversight and a lot more sway on the direction of the company, which I, I, I really appreciated. Um, and I think is, is, is helped, uh, I think me feel comfortable with, with the product and, and how it's going to be implemented. 
Um, so I don't know that it exactly answers the question, but I hope it, it kind of answers it in, in spirit, so. Thank you. Um, for someone interested in the aerospace field, do you have any recommendations, general recommendations or tips that is? Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a tough one. Um, aerospace in general uh, can be uh, cyclical. Um, not all areas of aerospace are that way, uh, but I can tell you aerospace tooling is extremely cyclical. Um, because the, the way it's structured right now, you've got external companies that do a lot of the tooling designs and a lot of the integration of the tools into, uh, uh aerospace vendors facilities. So, um, at the time I got hired, they had just come off of a 400 M a 380, some stuff for a 320. They were doing some stuff for 737. I got hired for phase two, three for a 350 jumped onto 737, then was on triple seven X. Um, and then right at the end of 777X, Airbus wasn't creating a new airplane. They weren't retooling and, and Boeing wasn't ready to pull the trigger on, on a new aircraft either. Um, so I found out the aerospace industry, at least the tooling part of it can be very, can be very up and down. Um, as far as aerospace though, I would say, um, I, I'm, I'm kind of blind to actually like the, the, the commercial aerospace side of it. I've done a lot of stuff in tooling, uh, but not a lot of stuff like within, within aerospace design itself. Um, so I, I would honestly just say like, try and find somebody uh, who, who, who's, who's been there, who's, who's kind of done a lot of stuff um, and, 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 and kind of just reach out to them on LinkedIn and ask questions. I feel like, it's happened a couple of times to me, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's thinking back now, like if, if, you know, if somebody were to reach out to me and just ask me questions, like I'd be totally open to, to, to answering that stuff. But so yeah, I can, I can say, uh, aerospace tooling, um, you'll probably get another chance here in the next year or two. I think the aerospace tooling industry is starting to pick up, but, uh, aerospace in general, um, I don't know. I would, I would say, uh, uh, I don't know. I, 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 I wish I could answer that question. Thank you. Um, at this time, we'll take any last questions. And is there anything else you'd like to add, Richard? Just, I, I just generally, you know, kind of thanks to, to, you know, Fresno State and, and especially the kind of the teachers and, and uh, uh, going through there, I, I I learned a lot more than I realized I did. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that's, that's carried me through is just, yeah, understanding like first principles matter if you want to be in really hardcore engineering design. So understanding like that, yeah, there's, there's always stress, there's always deflection, everything's a spring if, if, you know, or if it, if it, if it acts like a spring, like dealing with bolts, welds, all the rest of that stuff is, is super helpful to understand. Um, understanding that, 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 it's not just one thing. There's 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 stuff on either side of it, and even beyond that, understanding like the full scope of of what what it is you're trying to do, and that I think that goes for pretty much anything. Like engineers, I think are first and foremost problem solvers, and so really trying to understand what it is you're trying to solve before you before you really jump into solutions is is really important. And then um, just always be willing to like kind of keep your eyes open where you're at because you never know. You never know where you're going to use that information in the future. And I can honestly say like pretty much everything I'm doing now is, is because I kept my eyes open and I kept asking questions. I kept learning new stuff as I, as I, as I came across it. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Richard, for joining us and speaking to us today. Um, we also want to thank um, all of our participants who joined us today. We invite you to join us for our monthly tech talks. Um, we feature alum and professionals in all fields of engineering, construction management, and architectural studies. Our next Tech Talks will be on Friday, Friday, April 14th at noon. So we hope you can all join us and we hope you all have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard.